Hey, good morning, church. How are we doing today? Yeah, good, good, good. No, it's nice to hear you. Thank you so much, John, for sharing just such a, a special story for us. Um, I just want to pause kind of while, while they get things set up here. Um, you know, like John said, we're a friendly church. We're happy people. And you guys mean a lot to us. Uh, you guys matter a lot, a lot to us. You matter to me personally and my wife personally. And, and John is one of our elders. I don't know if he said that. But we're led here at this church by people that really love and, and care about you guys that that come here on a Sunday morning. And, and today we have quite a few people that are normally part of our team that are, that are sick, that aren't here today because, you know, they've got the flu or they're not feeling really well. And because they matter to us and they matter to me, I'm just going to pause and, and take a second and, and say a quick prayer for them. So, Lord, we just lift up to you all the people that, that we know and the people that we don't know that are dealing with the flu or that are dealing with COVID or that have bronchitis or whatever it is. And, um, Father, in Jesus' name, I want to pray that Cape Town doesn't have a flu season. Cape Town has a miracle season. And that as people get sick, then, Lord, that just opens up an opportunity for you to work in their lives. So, Lord, we, we pray a prayer over everyone's lungs, over their, their immune system, and we just ask that you boost it. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thanks for entertaining that with me. That, that means a lot. Today we're talking about something that kind of pertains to that, and that is, that is suffering. So I, I don't know a lot of people that would willingly, you know, as we sit down as pastors and a leadership team, uh, there's a couple things you don't want to talk about. You don't want to talk about money because then you're afraid no one will come back. And another thing is, is suffering. Suffering's a hard thing to talk about because it's extremely personal. It's you saying, okay, you have the things that you suffer with, the things that you struggle with, or there's circumstances in your life that make you feel like you're suffering. There's hard things that are going on. And for someone to stand on stage and give you a Bible verse or give you something about suffering, like it, it's, a, it's a point of tension because it may not fix your suffering or it may not help your suffering. But what, what I hope to get out of today is I hope that we can gain an understanding of why is there suffering in this world. And then next week we're going to continue. This is really one discussion that I'm breaking into two different weeks. But I know for me, I, I really can identify with this. And I know that my, my whole family can as well as you guys can. But, you know, I've been through some suffering. I've been through some dark times. been through some, some hard trials and tribulations. And, and I... I just want to take us on a journey today and say, let's go there together. Let, we, let's recognize that we all suffer, but it's different for all of us. You know, I, I say to my staff all the time, your worst day is somebody else's best opportunity. So the life that you live and, and whatever your situation that makes you feel like, man, I'm really suffering right now. There's suffering going on. I don't understand why there's so much suffering in the world. I like to always just remind myself that, hey, it's somebody on the other side of the world or even down the street from me or even under the bridge from where I live would give anything in the world for my worst day, that that would be their best opportunity. And that, that may be a truth and a fact, but that's not the way that we feel. And so I'm going to speak a lot to how we feel about suffering and then give us something that we can do and apply to it to maybe get some relief from it. And so I want to talk about what happens when we suffer. So I want us to all kind of unite around this. So when we suffer, we want to, and the first thing that we want to do is make it stop. That, that's it. It's, it's, it imagine if, if you're walking up, as I was preparing for this message, I was looking out my window, looking at the electric fence around our property and thinking, if you touch that electric fence wire, you immediately, something your brain says, stop. I want, I want, this, I want to get off of this. I want to make it stop. And when we're suffering, when we find ourselves in a place where we're unhappy with where we are, or maybe life is dealing you a bad hand, or you're feeling some pain from a breakup or a relationship, or from some kind of thing that's happening in your family, or, or maybe you just got you know, some general anxiety, or you're dealing with depression, but whatever that suffering is, you just want to first make it stop. Make it stop. And then the next thing you want to do is you want to make it go away. So th th these are the two things that, that we that we would give anything in the world to, to have come true in the middle of our suffering. Now, I can think of times in my life where I found myself laying on the floor or, or with my head on my desk, or uh, I used to do a thing, or lay in the bathtub and put my head under the water, not to drown, but just to drown everything 
else out there out. And I would give anything. I would say, God, make it stop and make it go away. So whatever situation you're in, maybe you're in like a work situation or maybe you're in a family situation where there's tension and there's, there's pain or maybe you're feeling bullied if you're at school or even in your job. I mean, bullying happens to adults and you think to yourself, if I can make this stop and I can make this go away, then the suffering can end and I can feel better, I can be better and everything can be okay. And while there is some truth to that, that doesn't actually solve what's happening in, in our heart. It doesn't solve what's happening at the root of things. And so if we include, if we take all of our suffering, all the hard days that we have, all the hard times that we have, all the hard times that we feel, and we, we take all of that, and if we apply Christianity to that, well, that's where sometimes we, we do suffering and injustice and where we can do you an injustice. See, we have this beautiful thing um, this, we have this amazing thing. Let me, it's, it's, it's awesome. Let me show you what this is. It's, it's not a prop. But we have this thing here, this Bible. And what's great about Christianity is no matter what I'm suffering with, I can find a verse in here and it can make me feel good. Right? I, I, wh whether I'm dealing with good things or whether I'm dealing with uh, uh, not having hope or whether I'm having money issues or whether I'm struggling with, with whatever it is. I can come in here and I can find a verse. And, and what, what, what's the danger in that is that I can find any verse in here that I want to suit my situation. And so I, I can pick through here. I can take things out of context. I can do whatever I want to. And I can find a verse and it can make me feel better. And if someone, one of my friends says, hey, I'm really struggling with this or I'm dealing with, with a, a problem with this family member or whatever, they share their suffering with you. Well, hey, you can go to Google, you can type in Bible verse, uh, suffering in-laws in town. And it will give, and Google will pop up Bible verses and you can send that, you know, send your verses on patience and endurance, can go to that person. And they can read that and they can feel really encouraged, you know. But, but th this isn't exactly the truth. It, this isn't exactly the best thing for us to do. Now, the Bible is the best thing for us, but there's a hard reality that we have to come around, and it's this that Christianity is tethered to a brutal fact. And, and brutal is such a strong word, but it's the perfect word for this situation. Christianity being tethered to it means that, that we can't separate the two. That with Christianity, with the Bible, with Jesus, with the resurrection, with all of those good things that we have, all those things that we talk about here in church, tethered to that, attached to that, is this really, really hard, unavoidable fact of life. And we try and separate the two because we just want the feel-good stuff, but actually the two are always tied together. And that brutal fact that Christianity is tied to is that there is a relationship between sin and suffering. So we are identifying ourselves with suffering. And so the brutal fact that's tied to Christianity is your suffering is tied to sin. So to, to kind of break the ice and answer the question, why is there suffering in the world? Well, the easy answer to that is there's suffering in the world because there's sin in the world. Now, I'll, I'll illustrate this to you. If, if you do something wrong, then there's usually a price to pay. You know, we tell our kids, we used to tell Leafa growing up, you know, hey, if you do something wrong, there's going to be a price to pay. Meaning that you doing something wrong, you sinning, is going to cause some kind of suffering situation later down the road for you. So maybe it's taking away an Xbox or it's taking away TV time or, or whatever it is. But, but we all know and can identify with those moments where we did something wrong and then we paid a price for it. So that would be a very personal relationship between sin and suffering but that's not what we're talking about today and that's actually not what, what this brutal truth actually is see what I don't want you to think is that oh my suffering is tied to my sin because I'm a sinful person I am then or I am now suffering and this is something a trap that we get stuck in because I've been there and I go back there I go back all the time in fact I've got the keys to that jail cell sometimes I unlock it and I put myself in it and I lock myself back in that jail and I throw the keys down the hallway and I convince myself that my suffering has something to do with the sin that's in my life and when you do that you're putting yourself in the position of God 
And you're saying that, man, I wish that my suffering would end, but it can only end if I do better. It can only end if I become better. My suffering can only come to an end if I can grow as a person or I can conquer this thing in my life. And that's not how it works. And, and the important thing that God wants to highlight, and he does this through some stories that we're going to read today about Jesus, is that this relationship between sin and suffering is not a personal relationship between personal sin and personal suffering. In fact, the relationship we're talking about is, is this. It's a global relationship. And it's the relationship between sin and suffering is a global relationship, meaning the whole world. When sin entered the world, it held the door. Now listen to this. When sin entered the world, when Adam and Eve sinned, when they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, when, when sin first entered and there was a separation between Adam and Eve and this per- perfect thing that God made for them and, and God who wanted communion and relationship with him, when sin entered the world, the door opened and it was held for death, sorrow, and despair to come right behind it. So because there is sin in the world, because sin exists, that is why there's suffering. That, that, that is why suffering exists for us. And it's so important to link this sin with death, sorrow, and despair, and destruction. See, even when you think about uh, physical suffering, you know, we get old. And as we get old, things break down. You know, I'm in a stage where I could, I could see great up front, but I can't see anything you know, at a distance. And now I can't see anything up front or at a distance. And it's starting to happen. And I'm like, okay, my body is degenerating and that is a natural thing. But you know what? That happens because when when sin entered the world, it brought death, meaning that, that we were made for communion with God, but our communion here on earth is not eternal. It has a start and a beginning point, meaning there is a time when we when we will all die and pass on. And that happens because sin entered the world. And and Paul tells us in Romans, he gives us a verse that backs this up. So here it is scripturally. I don't want you to think that this is just an idea that I'm talking about. This This is from Paul's mouth himself. And he says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, he's talking about Adam. So he's referencing Adam in the book of Genesis as we know it. And death through sin. So death spread to all people. So no one being able to stop it or escape its power because they all sinned. And what Paul is talking about here is is that we all are a part of this journey together. Sin is a global issue. It it came to all and no one can escape it. No No one can escape its power. That's what made Jesus in the resurrection so wonderful. Is that Jesus is the only person ever to exist that escaped the power of death. Jesus conquered sin because Jesus also conquered death. Because Jesus conquered sin, he was able to conquer death. And he's the only one that can do that. But to the rest of us, we can't escape that. And so I'm going to talk to you about uh, a a story of Jesus encountering a blind man. And and this suffering blind man that we're going to look at is is somebody that I want us to try and identify with. But Jesus is going to speak exactly to the idea that there's suffering in the world because of a global issue, because sin exists in the world. And, and there's not suffering in the world necessarily because you did something wrong. That's something that is so hard for people to break away from and to understand, is that it's not you. It's just the fact that, that it exists. That's why there's suffering in the world. So let's, let's turn to the story. Let's turn to Scripture. So, so Jesus was passing by. We're in John chapter 9, 1 through 2. What's interesting about this is a little bit of background is that Jesus and his disciples just left um, an encounter where they were going to be stoned. And they were, they, people were trying to kill them, put them to death, and they were trying to stone them. And so I would think that you would go into hiding, but Jesus, he's not going to do that. And so he casually is cruising down the road, even though people have tried to stone him and kill him. And as he's passing by, he notices a man who had, who had been blind from birth. So this is a guy born with uh, a birth defect, born being blind. And in verse 2, his disciples ask him, Rabbi, teacher, which is, is important because before Jesus resurrected, he was just a, a rabbi, another teacher. It was when he resurrected, he became Christ to everyone else. But anyway, so his disciples are walking with him, and they say, hey, rabbi, teacher, who sinned, 
this man or his parents, that he would be born blind. So what this is illustrating is that back in this day, and in our day today, but especially back in this day, people thought that it was just fact. It was just an unavoidable fact that if there was something wrong with you, it was because you sinned or maybe your parents sinned. There was a direct personal relationship between your affliction and your problem and the sin that would be in your life or the sin that would be in your parents' life. So the disciples are asking him this. I mean, they're just really curious. There's two answers here. Either the man was blind because of his own sin or because of his parents' sin. And so Jesus answers this. And Jesus, he throws a curveball because he doesn't give them the answer that they're looking for. Remember, they gave him two examples, himself or his parents. And so in in verse 3, Jesus says this. He responds, Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents have sinned. So I'm sure it's just one of those like mind-blowing moments for the disciples as they think, well, wait a minute, there's only one of two options. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 it's not any of them. And then Jesus goes on in in verse 5, and he says, or he goes on in this verse, in verse 3, and he says, But it was so that the works of God might be displayed and illustrated in him. So I want to explain this works of God thing to you, because this is another area where we can get kind of messed up. When we read this verse, we think, there's a man that had sin in his life. There's a man that is suffering. Jesus is saying, well, he's not suffering because of his sin. He's suffering because the works of God might be displayed and illustrated in him. So what I don't want you to take away from this is God is not sitting in heaven saying, I need 30,000 blind people, poof, put them on earth. Okay, I need 100,000 people that are paralyzed, poof, put them down on earth. Okay, Jesus, who else do we need suffering down there that we can fulfill? I was going to say Liverpool fans, but then someone corrected me. (laughs) So... That's for someone specifically. They know who they are. But the point is is that God doesn't need your suffering to prove that he's great or he's amazing. God didn't create a blind person so that he could go in and heal the blind person and show everybody how great and how amazing that he is. What, What God is saying here, what Jesus is saying here, is that the works of God will always overcome death and destruction and despair. The works of God will always be greater than sin. The works of God will always be greater than any affliction that there is. And so people are suffering, but you know what? When people suffer and as they suffer, the works of God will always conquer their suffering. And Jesus shows this and he displays this. And after he says this, he takes, he takes, he takes some, some of the clay from the ground and he, 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 uh, he gets it wet and he spits on it. And he makes like a, a clay and he puts it over the man's eyes and he tells the man to go and wash his face off. And what's so interesting about that, and this doesn't have anything to do so much with the sermon, is, is you think, well, why did Jesus spit in the mud and make a guy's, you know, rub it all over his face? That's kind of gross. You know, I, I think Jesus was just trying to show, because if you're healing people left and right, front and center, I think he's just making sure that nobody thinks that he's got a, a method that can be copied. And so maybe Jesus is saying, hey, my healing is unique. My healing is chosen. My healing comes through my will and my way. And I want to make sure that anyone that tries to copy that or looks for something that that could maybe say that this is a trick, I want to make sure and throw them off with it. So that's just something that I found interesting. If you read on and you wonder, why did Jesus spit on this guy's face? That's, That's kind of it. So the important thing that I want you to take away from this is that the suffering that you're going through in the world, it is is not because of something that you've done. Somebody in this room needs freedom. Somebody here needs to let go of that. Because your suffering is not contingent on how good you are today. Your suffering is not contingent on how good you are tomorrow. Your suffering and whether you get freedom from it, it's it's not contingent on what you can do for yourself. A suffering blind man sitting on the side of the road had an encounter with Jesus who used him as an example to show that he can overcome anything and everything. And now we're going to take that message of Jesus overcoming and we're going to tie it even more to us, even more to to what makes us who we are. And it's going to tie into even more of what actually gives us freedom, the freedom that we desire and that we're desperate for. 
And so we're going to talk about another man. We're going to talk about the suffering paralyzed man. Now, this is a guy who was pretty desperate. I don't know how desperate you've ever been to, um, to get rid of suffering or to get out of suffering. And as I was thinking about moments of desperation, probably the most desperate that, that I've ever been is, I don't know if you've ever sat on an ant nest or you've been chased by you know, a hive of bees. You know, when you, when you actually had a dream about this the other night that I was mowing a yard, I don't know where this came from, but I, I ran the mower over a, a hive of what we call in the States yellow jackets, and they came out of the ground and they swarmed me. And it's like in that moment, I would be so, I desperately would do anything in the world to get away from it. And Casey and I have this famous story. I just remembered this. I love my wife <laughs> on the front row here. When we first got married, I, hate, I do hate bees. Anything that flies and God put a stinger on it makes me just question his love. Now, I don't understand why that exists. I don't understand why God would, would create a murder weapon like that. So I, I run away from it. I don't like it. And at the beginning of Casey and I's marriage, I got so desperate to get rid of, to get away from a bee that was buzzing around that I threw her in front of it. And then she got stung. So... And she's allergic to those things. So, <laughs> hey, but I was safe. I was, I was fine. So de desperation kicks in, and when desperation kicks in, it makes you do some. It makes you do crazy things. You when, when you when you get really, really, really desperate, it makes you go through great lengths. It makes you do crazy things to get out of that situation. And here we have a situation where, where a man is a, this paralyzed guy, and he's got a group of friends, and his friends are absolutely desperate just to get this man healed. And I'm sure this man is feeling that desperation because there's this reputation that this guy named Jesus is coming to town, and Jesus has been going from town to town to town. He's been healing people. And so if you're sitting there paralyzed on the road or in a house, you can't move, and maybe you've got friends or family, and you've been a burden to them, and they feel that burden, but they love you and they care about you, and there's this man that's been healing people, I could, I could just imagine the desperation that would just rise in them. Oh man, could there be hope? Could there be hope that, this, that our friend would be healed? Could there be hope that the paralyzed man would no longer be paralyzed? You know what? We're going to believe in hope and we're going to go for it because we're desperate and we'll do anything that we can for it. And so Jesus is teaching he's in, and he's in a home. And the home is crowded and it's full and nobody can get in. And there's people that are spilling out of it because there's such a reputation around Jesus that he is a physical healer. That's the reputation. So these men, they bring their friend, they put him on a mat, and they take him up onto a roof because they can't get into the front door. And so what they do is they walk up the stairs. Many houses had stairs that led to the rooftop, and the rooftop was flat, and it was either tiled or it was maybe clay or it had, had some kind of plaster on it. And they actually went up there, and they dug through it. So they removed a big section of the roof. Now, I would think that would be awkward for Jesus below or for the, for the person that owned the home. But these guys were desperate. They didn't care. They were going to do whatever they could because Jesus was a healer. And they had a person that needed healed. And Jesus was the one that could do it. And they believed that nothing was going to get in the way of them bringing their friend to the man who could heal their friend. And so they dig the roof out and they lower this guy down. Now, watch what Jesus does. We, we miss so much of this. When Jesus saw their active faith springing from confidence in him, so these guys were confident that Jesus would physically heal their friend. He said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, I want to go ahead and, and be up front and say, Karina, you can go back a verse. I want to go ahead and be up front and say, that this is probably a disappointment to this guy. This is something when we read this, we think, oh, it's amazing. Sins are forgiven. Whereas the paralyzed guy's like, yeah, cool. You know, you're, I still can't walk. How am I going to get out of here? You know, the friends that are looking through the hole in the roof are probably waiting on the guy to get up and walk and move. And Jesus goes, hey, your sins are forgiven. And, and they're looking down like, and, and, and. And the paralyzed guy's looking up at Jesus and Jesus is just sitting there. No, I forgave your sins. But what this does is, is, see, they thought that Jesus was a physical healer. But Jesus looks past the physical and he looks at what really matters. 
And because he says your sins are forgiven, it puts something into motion. And what ends up happening is some Pharisees and some scribes were in the room. And these guys are listening to this, and they take these things seriously. See, our words today, they don't always mean a ton. When we say something, you know, we glaze over it or we move on. There's all kinds of things we say we don't mean on social media. But it's like words don't have as much meaning today as they used to. But for Jesus to sit in a room and say in front of Pharisees and scribes, your sins are forgiven, was like blasphemy. I mean, that was unheard of. No one had tried to do that in the past. And they had a real problem with this. And they told Jesus, who are you? And they start talking. They start bickering amongst each other. And Jesus, because he's Jesus, he knows their thoughts and he knows what's going on in their mind and in their hearts. And so Jesus, he speaks up. And he he says something. He says this to them. He says, you tell me which is easier. Is it easier to say the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up and pick up your mat and walk? So Jesus is like, which one's the easier thing to do here? Now, naturally, don't overthink this. It's much easier to say your sins are forgiven because nothing has to actually show from that. You can say, yeah, your sins are forgiven. Let's go out for dinner. And the guy's laying there. It's like, well, but he's still paralyzed. You didn't heal him. Yeah, but I forgave his sins. Now, it's much harder to say, hey, take up your mat and walk because that's something that physically has to be seen, physically has to be represented. For Jesus to do that, he must really have some power. He must really have some authority. And let me explain something else to you. So Jesus is so clever with the Pharisees. They're all, it's like uh, Wile E. Coyote and the Roadrunner. I don't know if anyone saw that cartoon. But Wile E. Coyote is always trying to catch the Roadrunner. And he's got all these gimmicks and these contraptions. And the Roadrunner always kind of seems to be one step ahead of him. And that's kind of the way that Jesus is with the Pharisees. And so they try and trap him here, and Jesus says, okay, if I pick two, which one is the harder to do? But what Jesus knows is that they believed, the Jewish people believed, that if you were still afflicted with something, like because this man was paralyzed, it meant that he had sin in his life. So this is that personal relationship that we talked about. This man has sin in his life, therefore he will always be paralyzed. And they're saying, Jesus, you can't forgive his sins because you don't have the authority to do that. And then Jesus says, well, if I can show you that I've healed him, then by your own law and your own beliefs, then you will know that I have also forgiven him of his sins. So Jesus does the harder of the two in their eyes. He says, take up your mat and walk. And guess what? He does. And he proves a point there to the Pharisees and to the scribes that this has nothing to do with your personal sin. This has nothing to do with what you've done wrong. And what I've shown you is that I, Jesus, will conquer death. I will conquer everything. And he set this man free. This man got up and walked because he he served a God that was greater than any personal sin or any personal suffering that we could ever experience or we could go through. You know, I'm so thankful that God cares about my heart more than he cares about my physical situation. I'm so thankful that God cares about my growth more than he cares about the things that make me feel kind of like I'm suffering or or maybe oppressed in a certain way. I'm so thankful that God sees the bigger picture for my life so that as I sit there feeling maybe sometimes paralyzed on a mat, that God looks down and I'm saying, just heal my legs, let me walk. And Jesus looks down and says, Chris, you're forgiven, you're loved, I'm with you, I'll never leave you. Nothing can overcome it. That's that's the God that I'm glad that I have access to. That's the God that I'm proud to stand on stage and say that you also have access to that. But see, unfortunately, there's a lot of people like the Pharisees and the scribes that that couldn't believe that. And I just want to deflate the room a little bit and say, it's okay for you to be sitting there right now and say, man, I'm suffering and this sounds great, but I just can't wrap my head around it. I just can't accept it. And if that's you, then I want you to look at this statement here because I don't want you to get stuck here. If you refuse to accept the brutal fact, that is that that sin and suffering have a relationship together and that it's a global thing and not a personal thing. But if you refuse to accept the brutal fact and cling to the myth that only good things happen to good people 
and bad things happen to bad people, then your faith will be ground to dust. See, if we're always waiting to be good, to get good, then, man, where, where is our hope? What, what do we have hope in? What can we put our hope in? And, and, I'll, and I'll prove to you why this is wrong. I'll prove to you why it doesn't work this way. Because you know what? According to our Bible, we believe that the worst possible thing actually happened to the best possible person. Guess who that is? It's Jesus. So who are we to say that we have to, that our suffering is tied to our sin, or our suffering is tied to how good we are, our suffering is tied to what we deserve or what we don't deserve, because there was this man that came, that he took on the, the suffering of the entire world, that the best possible person to ever exist in all of humanity, he came and he took the worst from all of us. See, if whatever it is that's causing you to suffer, even if you're suffering at the hand of someone else, Jesus came and he took that suffering on his shoulders. He's already taken it. And so here you have Jesus that sets the way for us. And he says, hey, your suffering exists because there's just a broken world that we live in. But that's not the broken world that you're stuck in or you have to stay in. And so I, I want to I give us some hope here. I've got a, a statement that I want to read you. We never want to give up hope while suffering. We never want to give up hope. However, however, we do not want to deceive ourselves of our current reality. See, I want you to have bulletproof hope. And you know how you can have bulletproof hope? Is you can disconnect your belief in God and, and your current reality and your suffering. Is that my hope has nothing to do with my situation. My hope has nothing to do with what's going on in my family or my job. It has nothing to do with how many flat tires I have on my car. It has nothing to do with, with what I see coming on Monday at work. My hope has nothing to do with any of that. And because of that, I can have bulletproof hope. Because I can put my hope in Jesus. The guy that took it all. The person that was the best possible person. And he took it from us. And he took the worst of us. And so there is nothing that can overcome my bulletproof hope. Because my suffering, it may exist because the world has sin in it. But it doesn't exist because there's something wrong with me. Or there's something that I'm waiting for. And so I want to leave you with a couple statements here. And I hope that they encourage you. And one of them is this. Jesus always points, and this is so good if we look at the teaching of Jesus. Jesus always points the question away from why and instead on the idea of what can God do with this. If you find yourself where, where you're suffering, if you find yourself in a hard spot, see, we already know why. Why is there suffering? Because there's sin. We know the answer to why. So let's not dwell on why anymore. Let's not think, why is this happening to me? Why won't this stop happening to me? You know, K Casey and I, we waited six years for, for her to get some visa issues sorted. For six years, Casey, because of some corruption in home affairs, could not leave the country. We were stuck here. You know what? It didn't do us any good to think, why is this happening? We know why it's happening, because there's brokenness in the world. Why is there corruption? Well, because the world's broken place. Why? Because there's sin in the world. Let's not dwell on why. Instead, let's think, what can God do with this? So early on, in our marriage, we came up with this thing that we would say, and we should go back to it more. But it's, I'm so thankful that I get to need God more. I'm so thankful that I get to need God. I'm so thankful that why does it matter that I get to need God more in this situation? Lord, thank you for my suffering. Because of my suffering, I get to need you today. Right? If we change that mindset in us and we change our heart and we stop asking why, and instead we start to ask what can God do with this? And I believe we've got a whole bunch of people that are going to be set free. And you know what? When these people in this room get set free, and those of you watching online get set free, imagine what then happens is that ripple effect goes out. You know, I'm, I'm emotional. I'm an emotional person. I'm so glad John also cried on stage, because now it's not just my stage to cry on. But you know what? I'm emotional, because I've been here, and I go back here. 
But I always, I always return to this truth, this fact of how much God loves me. And when I take the why away and I say, okay, what can God do with this in my life? Wow, I get to need God more today. I get to need God more today than I did yesterday. What, what a blessing that is. Because the God that I need more today, the God that I'm thankful that I need more, is the God that overcame sin, the God that overcame death. I get to need the God that took all of my sin off of me. What a pleasure. What an honor that is. Not only does why not matter, but guess what? Where also does not matter. The question is not where does our suffering come from, but what are we to do with it? See, it doesn't matter where our suffering comes from because we know where it comes from. It comes from what? It comes from sin. It comes from the fact that sin does exist. That's why, that's why, that's why there's suffering and that's where suffering comes from. But what are we going to do with it? So guys, church, we're going to talk about this more next week. We're going to continue to talk about why is there suffering. But today, why does suffering exist? It's because we live in a broken world. But the story doesn't end there. See, the story, as Jesus showed us twice today that we looked at, and there's even more in the Bible, but two of the stories we looked at today is Jesus overcoming that brutal fact that sin and suffering are tied together. And so I, I want to leave you guys, I want to read some verses to you. These are verses that brought me an enormous amount of comfort. If you find yourself that maybe this message has brought up some feelings that you've had or made you feel a little bit emotional or, or you know, like, like, oh man, this is really taking me back to a, a hard place in my life. I, I, I want to lead you with some, some verses that spoke so much to me in times of suffering and that our family has turned to and I've, I've spoken on here with you guys before. And even if you send this message to a friend, I want to leave them on something positive. It's positive because it's a truth. And it's a truth because it has nothing to do with you. And it has everything to do with Jesus. So in Romans, this is Paul writing to the church. And, and I'll read this and then we'll pray. He says, In the same way the Spirit comes to us and helps us in our weakness. We do not know what prayer to offer or how to offer it as we should. So what he's saying here, you can go back, Karina, is that we, we find ourselves in our weakness. We don't know what to pray. We don't know what to ask for. That's why it feels hopeless sometimes. You just feel the hurt. You feel the pain. You feel the suffering. But you don't know what to pray and ask for. And so in the same way, the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit. And when we say the Holy Spirit, we mean that thing that Jesus left. When, when Jesus left earth and he resurrected, he gave you a helper. And this helper, Jesus said, would be even better than having his presence here on earth. And he would give you this helper. And this helper, this spirit, it comes to you and it helps you in your weakness. And when you don't know what to pray for or what to offer or how to offer it as you think that you should. But then the next verse, the spirit himself knows our need at the right time. It intercedes on our behalf with sighs of groanings too deep. For words. Now just wrap your head around that. When you don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit does it for you. That, that's why it's groanings. Too deep for words. See, there's some of you out there, I know that there's people out there that need this. Is that you've got, you don't know what to do, where to turn, you don't know what to pray for, you just feel like life is hard, you're suffering, you're dealing with stuff. And, and you know, if that's not you and life is great right now, then fantastic. Put this in the back pocket for a day when it's not. But when you don't know what to do, the Holy Spirit comes and intercedes for you, it means it goes on your behalf to the throne room of God and it talks to God about what hurts you. And in the next verse, it says, it goes on to say, in verse 27, He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because the Spirit intercedes before God on behalf of God's people, that's you, in accordance with God's will. And then verse 28, And we know with great confidence that God, who is deeply concerned about us, causes all things to work together as a plan for good for those who love God. Right? That, that is such a good statement that we can be confident that we know that God is deeply concerned and cares about us. 
So let me ask you two questions as we close. Where do we find Jesus in this? Where, where do we see Jesus in this? I want you to see that Jesus is the man on the floor. And he's looking up. He's looking down at you who's paralyzed with suffering or grief. And he's looking up at your friends and your family who've lowered you down. But Jesus is the one that's sitting there. And he's saying, I see the most important thing in you. I see your heart. I see your soul. I see the things that you really, really need. And I forgive you of your sin. You are clean. You are clear. Now take up your mat and walk. That's, that's where Jesus is in this. And that's where Jesus is in your life. Stop asking why and where. That answer's already come and gone and it's done. Now start asking, okay, Jesus, where do I find you in this? And show me what to do with it. And so the second thing I want you to think about is where do I find myself in this? I want you to be honest with yourself. Where are you in this journey? Where, where, how, how much does it hurt? What kind of suffering are you going through? Is it because you feel like you've done something to deserve it? Is it because you feel like other people have done something that you deserve to take on? This is where I hope that Jesus leads you to a place of freedom. And so I'm going to pray for us, and, and the, then the band's going to come out and sing a song. And the reason that we do this is because as soon as you walk through those doors and leave, life happens. Life just takes over and it happens. I want to give you a moment to pause and reflect. I want to give you a moment to let this sink in. I want to give you a moment to maybe hear from God. I want you, maybe you've never prayed. You have never spoken to Jesus. Or maybe you've never heard anything from Jesus. This is your time. And in this song, as we sing, you can stand, you can sit. But if, I just want you to say, okay, Jesus, I'm here. If you want to say something to me, talk to me because I'm listening. So Lord, thank you so much that you just 